So our presenter this evening is Ann Plunkett. Ann is an attorney and human resources consultant. She has operated a human resources consulting business, Workplace Partners, since 1998 after serving in various corporate roles. She has served as an expert witness as well as an advisor for businesses on a wide range of employment issues, including employee screening and selection, employment discrimination, employment testing, training issues, drug testing, reductions in force, FMLA, ADA, sexual harassment, terminations, and employee handbooks, as well as many other human resource matters. Anne um, is a friend of mine. I've known her for a long time. And her daughter, Mindy, um, it also has lupus. So um, she can relate to what um, many of you um, and your family members are, are experiencing in the workplace. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anne. And like I said, when, um, when she is finished with her presentation, we will take questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Anne. All right, thank you, Amy. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our Employment Issues in the Workplace webinar. I hope that we will be able to provide some information that's helpful to you tonight. Um, there's a, a lot of ground to cover. And because you all um, are from so many diverse geographic areas around the country, um, we're, our, our focus for the presentation is really going to be mostly on federal law, but I will tell you the best I can um, about some of the states that will have state laws that may come up and, and, and may be of interest to you. Um, but I'm, I'll tell you now, I'm not an expert on all the state laws, but, um, but I hopefully will be able to give you some guidance um, when it's appropriate in certain areas. So um, as Amy said, my daughter um, has lupus and she's had it for a while. Um, so I've helped her as an employment lawyer navigate issues in her employment and then um, have helped lots of other people navigate employment issues with other chronic health conditions. Um, and there, um, as you all know, you know, lupus is complicated. People don't understand it. Um, it's different for everybody. And in a lot of ways, it's really unique. And I think because of that, it makes the challenges that each of you have um, unique to. So um, to start with, there are two major federal laws that deal with employees who have medical conditions. Um, and those two federal laws are called the Family and Medical Leave Act or FMLA and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I'm going to talk about both of those in detail um, in a few minutes. So we'll talk about those federal employment laws because you'll find that the more information that you have, um, the better you'll be able to navigate when you're faced with a particular situation um, at work. One of the other things that um, I wanna talk about before we get to um, real details in the federal laws is some of your company policies that, that you'll want to become familiar with. So my suggestion to all of you is to become familiar with all of the policies and procedures that your company has. Um, and one of the things I think you'll find is the bigger the company is, the more employees you have, the more sophisticated you're going to find in general, um, the company policies and procedures are, and probably the more sophisticated your HR human resource professional is. And in very small companies, they may not have these things. And so you're going to often be left, I think, to fend for yourself in certain situations. But in, in mid-sized to bigger companies, you're going to find an employee handbook. And these days, pretty much every company of size has an employee handbook that details the policies and procedures that relate to employment issues. And those policies are everything from discrimination and harassment policies to benefits information, which is, of course, important for you to know and then policies and procedures that have to do with paid time off um, 
and other kinds of benefits. So if you haven't already, um, get a copy of your employee handbook. It should be available um, and it shouldn't set off any you know, red flags to anyone if you ask for a copy of it, if you don't have it. It's just handy to have and to be familiar with. And when you get that handbook, one of the things that you're going to want to do is become familiar with the paid time off policies that your organization provides. So paid time off policies um, are called different things. A lot of times it's vacation pay. Sometimes it's called PTO pay or PTO days for paid time off. Sometimes it's sick pay. Um, but what you want to do is see what's available to you. What are the requirements? Is it for part-time or full-time employees? How many days do you get in a year? Do you have to work for the company for a certain period of time before you get any kind of paid time off? You know, what are the requirements for getting that? And I think even before you need any of these things, it's helpful to find out um, what those policies are. So look for vacation pay, look for sick pay, look for PTO. Um, and, and that has to do with how much paid time off you get. You may also be looking for leave of absence policies. Um, gen in general, leave of absence policies could be a personal leave of absence, a medical leave of absence, um, it could be um, a leave of absence for um, family and medical leave purposes, which we'll talk about again in a few minutes. Um, the leave of absence policies vary widely from organization to organization, and many smaller organizations may not have any kind of leave of absence policy. Uh, keep in mind that the leave of absence policy um, provides the parameters for job protected leave. It's not pay, it's job protected leave, or it may be leave that doesn't protect your job except for a certain period of time. Um, so if there's a medical leave of absence policy, you're gonna wanna know how long um, the medical leave of absence is for, is it paid or unpaid? Usually it's unpaid. Um, how it works, um, what the rules are, is your job protected when you come back or not, um, you know, how to apply for it, and hopefully all those things you're going to find in the company leave of absence policies um, that should be in the handbook. Um, then, hopefully, in the company policies section of your handbook, you're going to find information about short-term and long-term disability um, policies. These are insurance policies, STD for short-term disability insurance and LTD for long-term disability insurance. Many companies do not have short-term or long-term disability insurance. Um, in general, smaller companies tend not to have it. Um, this kind of insurance protection tends to be expensive. Some employers provide this insurance for employees free of charge. Some employers provide it for employees at their own expense. Sometimes it's a hybrid of the two. Um, I would tell you that if you have a diagnosis of lupus and you can get short-term or long-term disability insurance through your work, it would be a great idea to get it. Um, one of the things I've seen is that particularly young people, um, when, when they um, are hired onto a company and they're given all those forms at the point of orientation, and they look at a form about signing up for short or long-term disability insurance, um, it looks expensive and they'll think, well, I, I'll, I'll never need that. Um, don't make that mistake if it's available. Um, even if you have to pay for it, I think it's a really good investment and may come in handy someday. So the short-term disability insurance policies typically um, have a waiting period of 
oh, three to seven days before they kick in. And then what a short-term disability insurance policy provides is pay, usually at a percentage of your pay, and generally it's about 60% of your pay for a period of disability. And generally short-term disability insurance is for 60 or 90 days. So there'll be a waiting period that's not paid and then the insurance coverage kicks in and will pay for 60 or 90 days, whatever the policy is for, or the period that you're disabled. Um, those insurance policies require your physician to fill out a form and provide information um, that shows that you medically meet um, the requirements that you're disabled for that period of time and that you get um, that disability insurance. Then um, long-term disability insurance um, would kick in after the end of the short-term disability insurance. So if someone's disability period lasted longer than the short term of 60 or 90 days, then if that person had the long-term disability insurance policy in place, um, and if their doctor certifies that they still need, that you know, they're still medically disabled, then that employee could take advantage of the long-term disability insurance and receive a percentage of their pay for a longer period of time. Usually, the, these, these are insurance policies, so they vary widely, but long-term disability is usually for a year or two. Um, and that, that's a big general statement. Um, again, these provide a percentage of your pay. Um, sometimes it's not taxed. And so if it's not taxed, it ends up coming out to be fairly close to your um, pay, your, your net pay would have been after taxes. Um, so, so that's some information that you'll want to find out ahead of time. Don't wait till you need it. Find out ahead of time if any of those things are available to you. You're also going to want to take a look at whatever the other benefits are that your company may have available. And if you don't see any of these things in the company policies, it's always fine to talk to your human resources representative and get information. And that's generally the person who um, has the most information about any of these benefit related issues. Well, actually in many companies, at bigger companies in particular, there may be a benefits expert that can help with some of these things too. Um, all right, so those are some of the company policies that you're gonna look for um, and try to become familiar with, hopefully before you need them, so you know what might be available to you. Another thing that's kind of helpful to know is just how your companies handled similar issues with other employees in the past. Um, if, if you can find out um, about other employees who've had some kind of short-term medical issue or some longer-term chronic medical issue and had to take time off of work, how did the company treat that employee? Um, what pay, if any, were they provided? What um, benefits were available to them? Did they have insurance? And, and you know, did they, was their job held for them? Were they able to work um, from home? Uh, it used to be pre-COVID that working from home was an accommodation. We're gonna talk more about accommodations, but that was an accommodation that was kind of hard to get employers to make for employees. These days, it, um, uh, working from home, everyone's very familiar with, and um, it's a lot more standard. And I've seen it help a lot of people with chronic illness that getting to work to a workplace is very difficult, but there's a good deal of work that can be performed from home. And um, so one of the things you might find out is whether the company has a history of letting people work from home when they have some kind of medical reason to do so. And hopefully these days that's gonna be easier. All right, um, so 
Next, I'll tell you a little bit about the Family and Medical Leave Act and how this might apply and, and be helpful information for you to have. Again, the fam this Family and Medical Leave Act, the FMLA, is a federal law that provides unpaid leave of absence time for certain employees for a certain period of time. It applies only to companies that have 50 or more employees um, or who have 50 employees within a 75 mile radius. So if your company is, has fewer than 50 employees, this federal um, leave time will not be available to you. Um, if your company doesn't have 50 em employees who work within a 75 mile radius, it probably won't be available to you either. It's also not available for part-time employees. It's only leave time that's available for a full-time employee who works at least 1,250 hours in the year. And it's also only for an employee who has worked for the company for at least a year. So if you're brand new or short or short short-term employee or a small employer, you're likely not going to have this. That this Unpaid family and medical leave time is available for the birth or adoption of a baby or to care for a newborn or to care for an immediate family member or to care for an employee with a serious health condition. Um, so this is important for you all to know. If family and medical leave is an option for you, it may also be an option for your family member, your spouse or parent who might need to um, help you with your care for a period of time. If their company has family and medical leave time, um, their company might be able to help you. And if um, in, in this situation, since these your, those of you who are participating tonight are, have lupus, you would of course qualify for this if you're the employee with the serious health condition. But just remember that um, you're, you may have a family member who can get time off to help care for you if it's needed. Um, when an employee takes family and medical leave time, um, there's a bunch of administrative paperwork that has to be filled out. And again, and a physician has to certify that the employee or the family member has a medical condition that um, meets the requirements. Um, again, this is up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Most employers in their family and medical leave policy, which is supposed to be in the employee handbook in detail, you know, it's usually a four or five page policy. It's very detailed. Um, the policy generally will say that an employee can use any paid time off or vacation pay or sick pay or short-term disability pay um, as a mechanism for getting pay during the unpaid leave. It's not going to extend the 12 week period, but it's a mechanism for getting some pay during the unpaid leave. So for example, if you're taking family and medical leave of let's say eight weeks um, and um, you have four, four weeks of vacation pay, well, that's probably not very um, often gonna happen, but let's say you have four weeks of vacation pay, your policy probably says that you can use any unpaid vacation pay to be paid for the first four weeks or whatever time amount you have left. And then the rest of the leave would be without pay. So you'll look at that policy carefully to see how paid time might give you some pay during your unpaid leave. If you've already exhausted all of your paid time off, all your vacation pay, you probably won't have any pay. Another important aspect of family and medical leave is that this is job protected leave. If the employee who takes family and medical leave returns to work before or at the end of the 12 week period, they have the right to be restored to a similar position or it's called an equivalent position. 
So that means they can't put you on the night shift or give you some undesirable job. They've got to give you a job with, at the same level and pay and benefits. It may not be the exact same desk you had or the exact same job, but it has to be equivalent. If you're not able to return to work at the end of this unpaid leave period, the employer no longer has to hold the job open for you. And after that 12 weeks has passed, they can replace you. Um, and um, that sounds really harsh and it has, it can have a really harsh effect. So it's important that you know that the job restoration, the job protection is only for the 12 weeks. Um, when we talk about um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how that works together with this and might give you some other benefits. Okay, so another important benefit of the Family and Medical Leave Act is while you're on this unpaid leave, you get to continue your health insurance and all your other benefits. Um, although you may have to be writing a check for your health insurance premium, you do get to continue your health insurance. Another important aspect of family and medical leave is that you don't have to use the leave all at once. You can use it intermittently. And as we all know, lupus affects you um, in um, ways that no one can predict. And there'll be days that you feel fine and you're able to work and days that you can't. And so your physician can fill out the paperwork and let the employer know that you may need to use this leave time intermittently for half a day here, full day there, week here, whatever it is, when your disease flares up and you're not able to work. Um, so that's really helpful um, that this intermittent leave availability is there for you. And then finally, retaliation is prohibited under the law. It's illegal for an employer to retaliate or discriminate against an employee who has used family and medical leave time. Um, so employers are not supposed to do that. As a practical matter, it's a really hard thing to prove, but responsible employers know that they can't treat you differently um, if you've taken family and medical leave time. All right, um, and we'll have time to answer questions about this at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead now and move on to the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. Oh, before I do, let's go back for a second. On Family and Medical Leave Act, um, I mentioned that this is a federal law, but in many of the states that you all are from, there are also state Family and Medical Leave Act laws. I am not an expert at all the different state laws, but um, many states, particularly on the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, have um, state laws that are um, as good as or sometimes better than um, the federal law. So it's important for you to find out if you're in a state that has any state law benefits that go beyond or supplement the federal law. And you can do that real easily by just Googling your state and um, what the state Family and Medical Leave Act laws are. Um, and the, the same is true for um, state disability. So New York and New Jersey, I know, have state disability um, uh, insurance that um, employees with lupus may be able to take advantage of. Um, again, I'm not an expert at those state law protections, but find out um, what um, kind of state disability protections and insurance is available in your state. I know Missouri, Illinois, Kansas, we don't have those here, but on the East Coast, they're more common. Okay. So let's move to Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA um, is a federal law 
that says that any employer with more than 15 employees can't discriminate against someone who has a disability. And we'll talk more about that. It doesn't matter how long you work for the company. If your company has more than, has 15 or more employees, they're covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, most states, even Missouri and Illinois, but um, almost all states have um, an Americans with Disability, or have an ADA disability law that applies to smaller employers, usually with six or more employees. So the good news about the ADA is this discrimination protection is generally available to smaller employers, employees of smaller employers. Um, okay, so um, the ADA prohibits discrimination based on someone's disability and lupus would qualify as a disability or the perception of some that someone has a disability. You know, sometimes employers just have this perception that someone can't do something because of an illness. And even that having a perception about somebody um, can't be used to discriminate against that person with a disability or per, who is perceived to have a disability. And here's the real important part. The ADA requires employers to make a reasonable accommodation for an employee with a disability. That's big, that's big protection. Um, a reasonable accommodation could be anything from working from home, um, some kind of special chair, maybe it's a special screen, maybe um, it's a parking place up close to the building, maybe it's a ramp, um, you know, whatever that employee needs. The most common accommodation that employees need um, when they have a disability is additional unpaid time off of work. So you'll remember that I said that under the Family and Medical Leave Act, an employer can um, replace you after, if you're off more than the 12 weeks, How, and they can do that. But what you can get from an employer if your disability lasts longer than the 12 weeks under FMLA, you can get, um, you can ask for um, an accommodation for your continuing disability and ask that you be granted additional unpaid time off of work. Even if your job gets replaced, maybe they'll extend it and accommodate it and not replace you quite as fast. But even if your job gets replaced, um, if you get additional unpaid time off of work, it might permit you to continue your health insurance for a longer period of time or other benefits. So additional unpaid time off of work is an accommodation too. So remember that with your lupus diagnosis, you, you will qualify um, as a person who has a disability, maybe not all the time, but there'll be times or maybe a time when you do. And if so, you can't be discriminated at work on that basis. And, and your employer, you can ask to make an accommodation for your disability. The employer will likely require you to have a note from your doctor to support your request for an accommodation and that you need one for a medical reason. Um, by the way, the employer is not entitled to know your diagnosis if you don't want to tell them. Um, but all the doctor has to do is tell them that there's medical reasons that you need time off for family and medical leave or medical reason for some kind of workplace accommodation. So that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. Both of these laws um, can provide significant protection for someone who's dealing with a diagnosis of lupus um, at different times during your work. Um, we talked about the fact that um, this may provide additional protection after your FMLA is exhausted and that the accommodation might be additional unpaid time off of work. Okay, well, how do you enforce 
these laws? Um, well, um, first, your human resources department will be your um, best friend and resource to helping you understand what benefits available to you, helping you understand um, how to access your benefits and navigate all of these complicated things. If the human resources department doesn't or, or they don't do what they're supposed to do, you can go to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that will enforce the ADA and the anti-discrimination provisions of the ADA and also the FMLA, or the Department of Labor may also um, enforce the um, family and medical leave. And then your state commission on human rights and every state um, has a commission on human rights. Some, in Illinois, it's called um, the Illinois Human Rights Commission. In Missouri, it's the Missouri Commission on Human Rights. They all have similar names, but the, you can go to either your state agency or the federal agency to um, get your rights enforced um, if your employer is not co cooperating. I will tell you that this is not an easy answer or an easy fix and any remedy through the EEOC or your state department of human rights or the department of labor takes forever. It's really your last ditch effort to get your employer to do what they're supposed to do. Um, but that, that's how you do it. And, and another avenue would be to find a private attorney who's experienced in employment law who might be able to write a letter or talk to your human resources department or whoever is interfering with your ability to get the benefits that you should be getting because of your illness. Okay, um, I, it looks like we have quite a few questions. So um, we went through that pretty quickly. Amy is going to um, tell us the questions that have come up in the chat and we'll do our best to answer those for you. Yes, thank you, Anne. That was very helpful. So yes, if anyone has questions, um, you can go ahead and put them. Um, it'd probably be best if you just put it in the, the Q&A section as opposed to the chat. It's just easier to keep track of those questions. Um, so go ahead and type your question into the Q&A section. Um, and I'll wait for those to load up. I did have um, a couple of questions, and one okay. is you mentioned the the twelve weeks, um, and that you can take the the twelve weeks intermittently. Is that twelve weeks per year? What oh, how, what is that? Good question. It is twelve. It'll be defined in the company policy, but it's twelve weeks in in a twelve month period. And the employer gets to define how that 12 month period works. And most employers don't use a calendar year. Most employers use a rolling 12 month period. So at the time that a person needs leave, they would look back 12 months to see what, how much leave they've taken and how much they have left. I'm glad you asked that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, and a couple of questions are coming in. I, I have another uh, question about, because um, I know this comes up a lot about disclosing lupus. You had mentioned um, that you don't necessarily have to do right. that, but I know we get a lot of people who ask, like, are they required to disclose it during an interview? Are they required to disclose it if they're taking right. 12 weeks off? Right, okay. Um, so the answer to that is, and you're right, that comes up a lot. Um, you never have a responsibility or an obligation to tell your employer of your diagnosis. They're not entitled to know your diagnosis, but most employers don't get that um, and they think they are. But there's a difference between um, having a doctor say you have a medical reason um, for whatever you need and saying it's because of this diagnosis. So you're certainly free to share your diagnosis of lupus, 
Um, but you're not obligated to, not when you're asking for time off. You can just say it's medical, not, not at any time are you obligated. And you'll see on the forms that an, a, a, an employee and a physician complete to get FMLA time, it doesn't ask for the diagnosis. It asks for the medical reason or to, for the doctor to explain the medical reason. And as to like in a job interview, let's say um, you haven't worked for a period of six months or a year because um, your disease didn't permit you to work or for any personal reason. But um, um, people often say, well, do I need to tell them that I was sick or I had this diagnosis and that's why I couldn't work? Or do I need to tell them when I'm starting, hey, by the way, I have lupus and I'm gonna need this and that when I come to work for you. And my answer is, no, you don't have to tell them. Although I've seen it go both ways. <laughs> I've seen employers be really good about it, learning in the job interview, you know, yes, I understand you have lupus and you may need this or that or some extra time off or it may take you longer to do this or something. Um, and I've seen employers be really good about it. In, and I, now I'm talking about the hiring process. And then I also know that employers will move to the next candidate when they hear that, that scares them away. Now, the good news is now the job market is in any applicant's favor. Employers are looking for good employees and, and seem to be overlooking something that might stick in their craw earlier. And, and so maybe um, it wouldn't get in your way now. So I think that's a really personal decision about whether you want to disclose that in a job interview, but you certainly don't have any obligation to tell someone that. So hopefully that clears that up. Yeah, very helpful. Thank I'm, you. I'm glad you asked both those. Good. Okay, so um, here's the question. If you cannot stare at the computer screen for long periods of time because of your lupus, um, what other work from home options are available? Are there career counselors or job placement resources available? So some states have career counselors and, um, through the unemployment people and job um, coaches and things like that. It's really state specific. Um, so I would say in that situation, talk to your employer, um, because not every job requires you to stare at a computer screen all day. You know, there may be some other jobs that you can do from home. Um, uh, what I would tell you is that the law says, and now we're talking about ADA and an accommodation. So what the law says is an employer has to make a reasonable accommodation for that employer's disability. So if your disability, if your job is to stare at a computer screen all day because that's what your work is and your illness won't let you do that, the employer isn't going to be required to give you an alternate job um, to accommodate you because that would be considered unreasonable. But if computer work is a small percentage of your job, then it might work more in your favor. We're dealing with that word reasonable accommodation and there's no bright line test about what's reasonable. Um, what, what employers look at are the essential functions of a job and if the essential functions of the job in that particular situation are staring at a computer screen all day, they don't have to give you a job where you don't do that. Um, although if it's a minor part of your job, they, they should work with you. Thank you. Um, does the EEOC file for you or do you have to retain an attorney? Good question. They file for you and it's free. And same thing for um, any of the state agencies. Um, and in some areas, the state agencies are faster or slower. It depends. Um, none of it, well, I should say this, none of them are fast. It is not a fast remedy, um, but it is free. And um, 
So for example, if you've already been fired from a job for some reason, that might be a good resource uh, or recourse. You do not have to have an attorney um, to go to the EEOC or to go to any of the state commissions um, that will help you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> doesn't the HR department have to keep your information private? Yes, they are supposed to keep it private. Medical information is supposed to be kept in a separate file, not as part of the regular personnel file, and it's not supposed to be discussed with anyone who doesn't need to know. So yes, you know, um, they can share it with someone who needs to know, maybe an immediate supervisor or something like that. But in general, yes, medical information is supposed to be kept private. What are your thoughts on chronic illness rider insurance policies in Ohio and three other states? They're not allowed to be offered by a life insurance company. I have never heard of that. I don't know okay. anything about that. I'm sorry. What's it called again? Um, chronic illness rider insurance. Ooh, what did I just do? Um, I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of that. Okay. Um, can you give some advice on handling needing time off for frequent doctor's appointments? Um, yes, that's a good way to use um, uh, your intermittent leave. And so if you're going to have frequent doctor's appointments or physical therapy, or you just going to have good days and bad days, um, then definitely um, you will apply for family and medical leave, and then it's on file and your doctor certified it, and then you use it when you need your appointments or an infusion or whatever it is that you need. And I also tell people, you know, that, you know, use your, your sick late days or PTO wisely as well. So, you yes. know, if you just don't feel like working today and you have lupus, it, unless you really don't feel well, don't waste, you know, your PTO, right. you know, when you just feel like, you know, we all feel like that sometimes just skip and work today, but, but use yeah. it wisely. Yes, that's good counsel. Um, since working from home these past two years, my lupus has been under control, no flare ups due to being on my feet, walking too far, using the restroom, etc. We may be returning back to the office soon with a hybrid schedule. Do you think contacting my doctor now about accommodations is suggested to preempt going back to the office? It, it, it can't hurt. Um, and, and particularly with that data that for the period of time that that, that person was working from home and did well, and their disease was under control, that's a good reason to say, look, they need to keep working. And I think the employer is going to be hard pressed to say, oh, no, you have to come back now, because if it worked for two years, it should work now. So I, I would say you have a really good argument to be able to continue to work from home for medical reasons, even though lots of employers right now are trying like crazy to get people back in the office. Yeah, but it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and talk to your employer now. Oh, well, well, to your employer and your doctor. Um, probably start with the doctor and make sure your doctor's willing to support that ask. Great. Um, how does reasonable accommodation work for a lupus flare-up, particularly if it pertains to lupus fog? So I think what they're saying is they're, they have trouble sometimes, you know, focusing or have some memory issues. Well, if, if someone needs a, like a, additional time to complete a task, that's probably a reasonable accommodation. Um, but it, 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 an employer does not have to change the job requirements, the essential requirements of the job. Um, uh, so like in, in my daughter's situation, um, she worked in a healthcare setting and, um, and she, for a period of time when she was um, getting treatment and she was pretty sick, um, she, wa she was an analyst in a healthcare setting and she, she just wasn't able to do the work. Well, there wasn't any accommodation for them to make to give her work that she might've been able to do. That's when she took a leave of absence because 
she wasn't able to perform her job. And um, that's what the leave of absence time would be for or family and medical leave. That, that's more of a leave issue, I think, than an accommodation issue, unless it's something minor like, you know, it just takes me a little longer versus I, my brain's just not uh, cooperating right now. Would a 504 plan fall under the ADA? I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I, it, um, that's, that's okay. Some kind of special benefits, but I'm not, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, it, I don't see any other questions. Does anyone else have questions? You've got an expert here willing to answer. So we are, you know, we're almost done with time here, but would have, we should, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any other questions. Um, one of the other things I was going, I was going to mention to, to some of you that we hear a lot of are people who don't necessarily work in an office setting, who work in, maybe they're a cashier or they're, you know, they work at a department store or, you know, some of those situations where, you know, it may, you may not be able to work from home or, you know, but some, right. if you work for a large enough company and right, they, they have to follow um, all of these federal laws. Yes, they do, but they don't have to create a job for you. But if it's a big enough company, there may be a job that you can perform. So for example, um, I've had this happen with cashiers a lot. Um, someone who's a cashier and their job requires them to stand up. Well, not necessarily. A reasonable accommodation might be to give them a stool to sit down on, either a stool to sit on to perform their job or a stool to rest or an extra rest period. But, um, you know, I had, I've fought with several employers over the years who say, but our cashiers have to stand up. And I'm like, no, they don't. <laughs> Oh, I, we can use this high stool right here and they can manage just fine. And that was all that was needed. Um, so yeah, you have to get creative sometime and really convince them. But um, yes, many jobs are not performed in an office. And, and so different kinds of accommodation issues come up. Okay. Um, Large companies offer access to extra benefits like AFLEX that can be, that can help in access to basic company yeah. benefits. Right, yeah, some large companies have AFLEX insurance policies available for employees to purchase. Um, and if that's available um, and affordable, that might be something that could provide some extra income and protection. Yep. Um, this is a good question. For intermittent leave, how much notice is needed? I don't always know when I will flare, and sometimes it's very sudden. Right. So um, in that, that's why you fill out the FMLA leave form ahead of time and get your doctor to certify ahead of time that there will be times when you'll need intermittent leave without being able to provide notice. You know, you obviously give them as much notice as you can, but exactly, um, sometimes, often, you know, that happens without any kind of warning. And so if you get the paperwork in place and the doctor certifies that ahead of time, then um, you're all set and you call your employer that day and say, I'm having a, um, a flare and I'm, I'm gonna need to take intermittent FMLA today. Great. <clears throat> um, I, there's a question about what is considered full-time employment, and I would assume that is, has to do with what your employer considers full-time. Well, no, it was, it was the 1,250 hours a year. Okay. They, had, they have to, um, to be eligible for FMLA under the federal law, you, had to have, you have to have worked at least 1,250 hours in a year. Okay. So a very part-time employee, if you're working 20 hours a week, you're not going to need it. Um, but that's the definition, 1250 hours. Okay. okay, any other questions, anyone? Okay, don't see any. Oh, yeah, I do. What is part-time permanent? 
it's a designation that some employers use and it depends what they define it as. Um, if I'm giving advice to an employer, I would tell an employer there's no such thing as a permanent job <laughs> because there's no such thing as a permanent job. But I think sometimes employers use that designation and if they do, they give it the definition that, that, that it has. And for them, it, I think that what they mean is that it's not on an on-call basis, but it's on a regular basis. I think they mean regular, but I would say, look at the definition that the employer uses. That's not a legal term. Okay. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I want to thank Anne for being here tonight and sharing her expertise with us. It's, it's always great to have someone who has such great knowledge and to share that with us. So I know you all join me in, in thanking her. And I want to thank all of you for attending this evening. Um, and yep, we're getting some thank yous um, to you, Anne. So, um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please check back with your local chapter. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future programs. Well, thank you for letting me present to you this evening. And I wish all of you the best. Thank you. Good night, everybody.